the way to think about AI, mm -hmm. and this is from a bunch of the machine learning folks that work at Maloco. Maloco is very much a machine learning company. We were founded as a company that was designed to bring access to high quality, high scale machine learning to the advertising ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about AI, there's generative AI, there's all sorts of other AI tools. Really the underlying technology of machine learning is what creates the value. The AI is more of the front end that someone would use to engage with. The machine learning is what helps make decisions and learn. And so when we think about generative AI and large language models being trained on data, that's designed to provide an output to a, to a person who's asking it a question. Okay. When you think about in an advertising context, what we're doing is leveraging different data sets that are traditionally provided by marketers or by publishers mm -hmm. and helping them solve a business problem by making faster predictions with much deeper insight and much bigger scale than a group of humans could do on their own. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much generative AI, but more what we call operational machine learning, okay. which is the value of the industry specific knowledge and data combined with really sophisticated machine learning models. So yeah, you, we, you mentioned uh, chat GPT and, and how, or, or these large language models. Um, is there a similar kind of training process that you do, or how, how does that work? Like, what are the data sets that, uh, that you train your models on? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, our models rely on two things. The first thing is high fidelity, high volume, high predictability data coming in in the form of RTV bid requests or okay. in the form of information about how a consumer is consuming a particular content or an app within that content or something like that. And then the other side of the equation is, did the prediction that we made leveraging that data come true? And so what you need is data on both ends, both data that helps you identify attributes about this opportunity, this moment in time you get to serve an ad, and then a closing of the loop that says, you served the ad and here's what happened. Mm -hmm. And so all of our customers that we work with on the mobile app DSP side uh, are giving us data about historical events that equate to customer lifetime value. So it's very common for us to get six or eight weeks or 10 weeks worth of data dumped into the machine learning model. We augment our profile tables with that information and then we're able to drive accurate predictions of how we can find similar actions that that marketer would want to take. And so it's very much about leveraging your first party advertiser data. And it, the most important thing is that you as an advertiser have to understand the value of that data for every one of those consumer touch points. Okay, now uh, Google has this product, Performance mm -hmm. Max. Um, what can you tell us about that? What it means in terms of either uh, transparency or kind of other issues that affect uh, for advertisers and in maybe just the the uh, programmatic space in general? Yeah, it, it's a it's a great question. Performance Max has been in the news quite a bit lately because there was a bit of an issue around a lack of transparency for marketers, mm -hmm. and so Google has had to now go back and open up more transparency with it. But putting that aside for a second, sure. Performance Max or even the Facebook products or the Instagram products or the YouTube products, they're designed to take a marketer's budget and deliver marketer outcomes that they've deemed as profitable outcomes. It's supposed to be very simple. And they use heavy machine learning to drive the decisions about when to serve ads to maximize the likelihood that those profitable outcomes can happen. Mm -hmm. That's a very different model than what ad tech has historically done, or even media in general. If you look at the way that most media is bought today, you have a marketer who goes out and says, this is the audience I need to hit. Whether that comes through you know, research from a psychologist that you bring in to study your customers or looking at historical data, you're basically saying, I want this cohort of people and I want to serve them ads. Okay. Performance Max, Instagram, YouTube, they don't do that. They don't preemptively determine who that audience is going to be. They let the machines make an association between the outcome you want and the user who's going to receive an ad at that moment. Okay. 
And so there is no sub, there is no, no, there's no concept of segmentation or cohorting within these platforms. It's much more, there's an opportunity to serve Dave an ad right now. What's the most likely thing to convert in with this ad right now? And then how much can that advertiser pay for that ad opportunity? That's very different than if you're Chevy and you're clicking the blue Kai auto intenders inside of trade desk and serving them ads. That doesn't mean that that person is going to go buy a car right then. Now there are different marketing objectives, but the point is that ML driven platforms don't want you to create cohorts. They want you to leave the aperture as wide as possible so that you have the best possible chance of picking the right moment in time to serve somebody an ad. Well, I was hoping you could tell us a bit more about how uh, uh, artificial intelligence is being applied to CTV. We've seen enormous growth in the number of households that are connecting their TVs directly to the internet and, you know, the, the traditional television industry is changing as a result from the old ways of doing things of, you know, distributing things among stations and uh, using other methods of measuring. Uh, but now with CTV, you have different kinds of signals, different methods of targeting. What can you tell us about maybe what you learned from the digital space and what it'll, how it'll be applied to CTV? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So the the first thing I will tell you is that there is no one person who has a perfect full view of everything happening with machine learning and AI across the industry because everybody's doing something with it. Uh, and so it, it's hard to speak broadly about what everyone is doing. What I can tell you I've seen so far is that there are two really interesting use cases. The first one is things like what Maloco does, which is at runtime, when an ad opportunity comes available, how can we make the best possible prediction of what's gonna happen next? And that's, that's something that, you know, there are other companies out there that do similar things. I think Google and Facebook are probably the, the two most obvious biggest. Amazon is about to do some of very similar things. The thing that's really exciting about Netflix is not just that they have a huge subscriber base, but this is one of the most sophisticated machine learning companies in the world. And so when you think about what's possible within their environment from targeting, it's very different than what's possible or what we've thought of in some more of these linear traditional experiences that we see as, as consumers. Mm -hmm. And so that's one bucket or area of it. Okay. The other part that's really interesting is how marketers and their agencies are starting to use better AI tools to create these cohorts. Mm -hmm. Now, again, going back to what I said, we actually prefer not to have things cohorted. But the fact is that there are a lot of agencies and advertisers who are getting better at creating these cohorts by using some of these AI tools. And so those are the two most obvious things that we see. And the real question becomes, how can the CTV space tie back to the outcome that matters? Because that's the big gap. This is a tall task for media companies and marketers alike. There's 75 years of history of trading around a Nielsen currency. Right. And the most of the sessions this morning were about alternative currencies. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you leapfrog the whole thing and you don't trade on a currency, but rather you just buy media the way that you know you're gonna have to go and get an outcome. The same way that a general contractor buys lumber knowing he's gonna go frame a house, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's a similar idea where you don't necessarily have to give yourself these proxy metrics if you get to the point where you really understand your customer's LTV at every touch point that a, that a consumer has with your brand. And that's one of the big exciting shifts that becomes possible with ML. Well, Dave, uh, this has been really informative. Um, I was hoping you could tell us uh, maybe looking ahead uh, the next six months to a year, if there's anything our viewers should be aware of or anything that's top of mind for you or perhaps something you'd like to see happen? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I'll give you one that I would like to see happen. Okay. I don't know if this is gonna happen in the next year, okay. but I think it's an important thing to think about. The role of you know, media buyers, marketers, CMOs has been about allocating dollars in hopes of growing the total sales volume or growing some amount of revenue, increasing the amount of, of revenue a company does. And that's done through figuring out where to apply your media, knowing that you're very likely not gonna be able to measure all of it. It's physically impossible to do it, and that's okay. Marketing has been working for a very long time, even with our broken measurement. But given that ML models are out there, the same way that every single airline 
is trying to figure out how to use a chatbot and train their chatbot on data that will feel, fuel an LLM for them specifically. The job of a consumer experience expert at one of these airlines has really become about training ML and data access. Mm -hmm. I think the opportunity for CMOs to take on a similar role is very, very important. They need to figure out how to unlock their data. They need to work with their lawyers. They need to work with their privacy folks, with their infosec folks, to figure out how can I get access to this data so I can feed it into a machine learning model that I'm training to maximize the business value that I can create as a marketing effort. And so I think there's a big opportunity for marketing organizations to play a much bigger role in data and infrastructure uh, and, and in targeting, and in particular, how they can get their organization to unlock the value of the data that lives within it.